What I'm going to do in this section is to uh, take the framework that Will laid out, the conceptual framework of what ethics is about, what, as, in, as a field of, of thought, as a discipline of thinking, a, a branch of philosophy. And I'm going to start putting flesh on those bones. He gave us a skeleton. We're going, now going to uh, um, build out the, the being. Uh, and I'm going to start with this issue of selfishness, not because it's the most uh, fundamental aspect of the objectivist ethics. It isn't, as we'll see, and we'll see why. But because that is where so many people begin with Ayn Rand, and uh, because it has, is what has made her so notable and in many circles, notorious. I'm sure that as people who are familiar with the philosophy, you have seen time and time again references to Ayn Rand as the one who preaches selfishness and screw your buddy and me first, um, uh, winner take all uh, uh, kind of ethic. Uh, when the, uh, the Atlas Shrugged movies came out, and began to get reviews. This is especially true of the part one reviews because that was the first movie. Uh, the critics just went wild um, over that issue. In fact, there were some reviews by notable film critics that said hardly anything about the aesthetic issues of the movie, and frankly, there were some. But um, uh, it was all about how awful Rand was and, and how these characters embody this heartless, cold, selfish, um, anti-human uh, ethic. <clears throat> and the reason for that kind of thing is uh, the conventional view of selfishness. So that's where I want to start. <clears throat> uh, the conventional view is what? It's being selfish means acting for your interest at the expense of others. That's the way I think most people conceive of it. And specifically, acting for your monetary gain, or for power, which is inherently power over others, uh, or taking a bigger piece of the pie. I mean, all of these metaphors are ways of um, saying it's, are all framed by a sense of self versus others. So you gotta be, if you're for yourself, you sacrifice others. Um, and so what ethics should be teaching us, and this is, uh, the basic uh, idea behind a lot of the, the uh, uh, other theories that Will was talking about. Uh, the basic idea is that at the point of ethics is that we have to be taught to sacrifice for others to counter our inherent drive to sacrifice them to ourselves and to take only our fair share or do only what is fair or treat them honestly. <clears throat> and so in that sense, um, selfishness means, uh, in, inherently means something negative, and altruism, uh, its opposite number, um, comes out meaning, well, whatever's good. So I've heard the word altruism used to describe um, like the dedication of a scientist uh, where there, it's just his interest in the field. There's, where there's no, it's not about um, sacrificing his interest to others. I mean, he's really interested in this, in his subject, um, but it's idealistic. It has, you know, it's a, it, it's a motive that people honor, and so they call it altruistic. So uh, th these terms are used in a very loose and sloppy way. <clears throat> Among, and I'm talking so, so far about con conventional attitudes, the kinds of things you'll hear um, in the pulpit, uh, in newspaper editorials, in commentary, in parental advice, and so forth. But even among those who think professionally about ethics, uh, such as theologians or philosophers, uh, take, have, have developed this basic idea and the basic 
sense of a conflict into um, more systematic ways. Uh, I'll just give you one quick example from religion and one from philosophy. Uh, in religion, the whole idea, the whole Christian idea of love thy neighbor as yourself. That's a, that's a slightly refined version of the conventional distinction. Why? Because it says you can't, it, it's not that you're not allowed to love yourself, but you just can't love yourself any more than you love others. This was the great rule that Jesus taught in the New Testaments. So you, you are just one, one unit in terms of your interest, but you're, as an agent, as a, as a moral being who is pursuing goals, you should be acting um, just as much for your neighbor as for yourself. And something very similar um, is, has been worked up in the form, in philosophy, in the form of utilitarianism, which actually, the basic principle is really the same. You count for one, but not for more than one. You should be acting to achieve, to promote the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. And so, just as in, uh, in Christianity, in the history of Christianity, saints like St. Francis um, declared a vow, took a vow of poverty, and you know, lived um, uh, as much as possible without wealth, without fancy food or clothes or whatever. In the same way, a contemporary utilitarian named Peter Singer, a, a professor at Princeton University, uh, has put forward an argument that basically uh, everyone living in America um, is morally at guilt for the fact that even middle class and lower middle class people have a level of affluence that if they gave it to, his example was starving people in Bangladesh. This is an essay from the 70s during a famine there, but it could be anywhere, Africa, um, South America, wherever, that we should be giving basically the bulk of our income to help those people and save their lives. And if, we, if we're not, we're not serious about ethics. So again, it's love your neighbor internationally as thyself. <clears throat> but this whole conception is completely at odds with objectivism, completely at odds with the ethic that Ayn Rand put forward. And what makes it at odds is not that objectivism takes the side of the self, the other side of this dichotomy. No, it re reframes the issue, and that's really the main burden of what I want to say today. Rand pointed out that the issue of egoism versus altruism, or selfishness versus selflessness, uh, is a question about the beneficiaries of your action. Who should benefit? from what you do. But that's not the fundamental question in ethics. The fundamental question is, what values uh, should you s seek? Now, when you seek values, uh, as Will was saying um, previously, you're seeking a value for something and it has to be valuable to someone. So that the, the to someone is where the beneficiary comes in. But you can't even talk about um, what's good for you or what's good for beneficiaries without first identifying what's good. So that's where objectivism starts. And uh, the way in which Ayn Rand raised the issue is by asking, what are the roots of the concept of value? On her theory of knowledge, her epistemology, uh, Every concept has to be formed by observing certain things in reality and then abstracting what the common properties are. So we have to ask, okay, we have this concept of value, but what does it refer to in the world? If it doesn't refer to anything, it's an empty, meaningless concept. It's like gribble. What does gribble mean? What does it refer to? I don't know. I just made it up. It doesn't refer. If value, it, if we can't anchor value in facts of reality, then 
the concept of value, and therefore all of ethics, has the same exact epistemological status as Gribble. So Rand's answer to this, um, which you're familiar with, is that the basic fact of reality that gives rise to the, requires us to conceptualize values, is the fact that uh, of purpose of action. Living organisms act for goals, they initiate action, they engage in purposive or at least goal-directed activity, even without below the level of consciousness, even for, say, even for plants, are driven by, um, their actions are governed by certain, obtaining certain things they need in order to survive. And that in order to survive is the other piece of, the other key fact. Organisms, unlike inorganic matter, has to do something to survive. Life is conditional. So we have a situation where there are these entities in the world, the or, the, all of them, they're organisms, and on a very, very abstract level, what they all have in common is they can engage in goal-directed activity, and they have to because they can perish. Their continued survival, their continued existence depends on their acting in the proper way to get what they need for survival. So what this means is that the concept of value on this theory is, goes way beyond ethics. It goes way beyond even human life. It's rooted in this broad fact of, that there are living organisms in the world. <clears throat> and next, if we understand that that is where the concept of value comes from, what it identifies in the world, then every organism's life will be the value that ultimately it is seeking. It seeks food, why? So that it, continue, so that it can can continue acting and reproducing and doing everything else, and why does it do those things? So it can survive. But for, and here we come then to the, uh, the role of causality. Because for every species, it has certain needs that it has to satisfy if it's going to survive. And it has certain capacities to act, certain specific ways, routines, uh, methods, um, that it is capable of employing in seeking what it needs in order to survive. So it's really, we, turn, we almost turn now to biology for any species. We could say if, if there were an ethics for tigers, let's say, there isn't because they don't have free will as far as we know. But the ethic, uh, leaving that aside, if we can um, stretch a thought experiment, what they would be, what would be is I need meat. Okay, where am I going to find meat? Well, there's some, um, and I'm fast. So, um, but these ones over here, they're faster than I am, or, you know, they, they're going to get a jump on me. Uh, but here, there's a weak one, I'll go for that. Uh, right, yes, good. That's what you should do. You're being a virtuous tiger. But let's now restore the... Um, the missing assumption of free will and turn just to human beings. Human beings, uh, ethics for human beings are just the same. What is it that we need and what is it that we're, uh, what capacities do we have to pursue those things? So I'm broadly speaking, uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, Will and uh, Alexander Cohn are going to be spelling this out much more fully uh, later today, but broadly, the fundamental human mode of survival is production. That's the root of everything that we can do. We can produce, we can change our environment and uh, create values that weren't there before instead of just having to find whatever is there. And how do we do that? Our chief means, our chief uh, capacity is reason, the exercise of our conceptual faculty. <clears throat> If we take the starting point that 
for each of us, our life is, is an ultimate value. Um, what are some of the values that we have to pursue in order to achieve that? Again, we're going to be talking about that um, in later sessions. But I want to mention one set of values. Ayn Rand called them cardinal values, which she said there are three cardinal values, reason, purpose, and self-esteem. And this is a, um, an area of the objectivist ethics where I, I, Ayn Rand had a short paragraph on this, and that was all she ever said in print, as far as I know. Um, so what you have to think, so what does she mean? In the logical structure of objectivism, we put forward um, an interpretation that I think is, is solid. I haven't heard any good <laughs> criticism of it. Um, and so let me just briefly summarize what our conception of the cardinal virtues are. In, in uh, philosophical ethics, there's a common distinction between instrumental values and um, constitutive values. It goes back to Aristotle or earlier. An instrumental value is something you're doing for the sake of getting something else. And once you've gotten that something else, the instrument, you, you're done with the instrument, okay? Once I take the trash out, because my goal is a clean house, once I take the trash out, okay, removing trash doesn't remain as, you know, for the rest of my day anyway. <laughs> it's just something I do now in order to get a result a moment later, and similarly um, with longer-term careers. A constitutive value, however, is something that is part and parcel of the goal that it serves. Um, the analogy that's often used in philosophy is um, <clears throat> I want to dance by doing a waltz. Well, I don't do the waltz now in order that um, dancing occurs at some later time. Doing the waltz it constitutes dancing for me right now. And similarly, there are many values that we seek um, because they are part and parcel, they're so fundamentally a part of what it means to, to be alive as human beings, that they are always there, always practiced, but always uh, realized and enjoyed at the same time. And that's the status that I, we think reason, purpose, and self-esteem have. Reason is a value. It's not just our means to achieving other values, but it is itself as our most important tool of value. And because we have free will, and, and specifically because our free will it, uh, is essentially this self-governing choice to think, we need, we need to be at all times pursuing reason. That is, we have to be valuing reason because there are many temptations not to value your reason, to take shortcuts, to engage in fallacies, to evade, to engage in wishful thinking or emotional uh, um, substitutes for reason. Why, how, realizing that reason is not just a technique we can use, but it, it is itself a value that we need and need to have in play all the time as something, at least in the back of our minds, subconsciously. Um, that's what makes it a cardinal value. Purpose. Um, we are purposive beings. That's, the, uh, that's an essential trait of organisms, all organisms. And so in our lives, we pursue many different purposes. But over and above that, having, purposive, ha having purposes, being purposive, including things like knowing what you're doing and why, being goal-directed, is wonderful. <clears throat> A wonderful line in, in our little short scene in uh, Atlas Shrugged, where Francisco um, D'Anconia, as a boy, uh, someone, I think it might have been Dagny's mother, um, uh, or maybe it was just Ayn Rand speaking about him, he, f he flew through his days like a rocket. But you could stop him at any point in time, and he could tell you what he was doing and why. <laughs> I always thought that was a great uh, uh, dr uh, literary uh, embodiment of of the, uh, the, of the whole idea. 
Um, and self, uh, self uh, for Rand, it was reason, purpose, self-esteem. Self, you need to value yourself because you, you are your life. It, you know, it, there's, you're the thing that's living. Uh, so valuing and, and maintaining yourself as an agent, as someone capable of successfully pursuing goals, again, that needs to be kind of a part of the framework of thought about going about life, about making the choices we make in life. Uh, Ayn Rand, I think, said self-esteem specifically, and not just self, um, because of an additional fact. Because we have free will, and because we have to acquire the knowledge and standards and values that should guide our lives, they're not inbuilt as they are with other, um, other species, we need ideals. And, and because of that, we need some way, we need to know internally, we have introspective capacity, self and knowledge. We need to know whether or not we're living up to our ideals. We need the sense of being right for life. OK, so those are cardinal values. Now, uh, I want to move on uh, to uh, another point about uh, we're still at a pretty fundamental level in the objectivist ethics. Ayn Rand argues that uh, ethics begins with a choice, the choice to live. Now, I mentioned earlier that Rand's view of free will is the choice to think. And that is, as the theory of free will, that, that is the essence of the view. But life itself is one of the choices that we make in terms of our, our choice of action, our choice of what to do in life. The first choice, in a sense, the most fundamental choice is, well, Am I going to continue my life? And because of that, the objectivist ethics regards all principles as, um, here the term is hypothetical conditionals. Um, hypothetical you know, logic means an if-then statement. Uh, so if you want to live, you must produce. If you want to produce, you must think. And you must do all these other things if you want to live. And this is very different from the kind of Kantian ethic that Will mentioned, where Kant's rules are categorical imperatives. They just say, you should do this. No, no conditions. You should do it. Objectivism is different. And it's different because fundamentally, you, you're making the choices about life, and those choices go all the way down. All right, now, if life is the ultimate value, what about some other pretty important values that people have talked about, and in some cases made the basis of their ethical systems, such as happiness, or flourishing, or virtue? I mean, all of these are, are um, considered as fundamental values within many different forms of Aristotelian ethics, which is, in many ways, quite close to objectivism in this skeletal framework, logical framework. Um, objectivism clearly is not against happiness, <laughs> on the contrary. But uh, a successful life, if, if, uh, that is, a life lived in accordance with reality-based principles, should produce success, which should produce happiness. Um, it, it's never all that simple, but um, that is the basic um, reason why, why happiness, and even seeking happiness, is a, very, is a rational part of uh, a good life. But the problem of making happiness the ultimate value is that what makes us happy depends on what values, to some extent, on what values we've already accepted. So if, for example, uh, Gail Wynand was happy at having so much power over other people. Why did that make him happy, to the extent he was? Because that's how he thought you had to live to get ahead in the world. And 
he was very good at it. But that's not the right value orientation to start with. So the philosophy, moral philosophy called hedonism, which makes pleasure the ultimate goal or happiness the ultimate goal, is, is not, it's not wrong in the value it attributes to pleasure and happiness, but it's wrong in saying that they are fundamental. They are derivative values. And I would say the same thing about um, character or virtue. Aristotle himself believed that the ultimate goal was living in accordance with reason uh, or living in accordance with virtue because he thought virtue was a practice of, of our rational capacities. And again, that's not completely wrong, being virtuous, uh, having a good character. That's a huge asset. We need it. And um, again, as Will was explaining, it, when, when we make habitual, the the act, kinds of actions that um, get results, that succeed in what we want to do, then um, we have a strength that enables us to do even more and to do it faster. So character is important, virtue is important, but it, again, like happiness, it can't be fundamental because it, it leaves unanswered the question, what makes something a virtue? Is self-sacrifice a virtue? Well, why? Is being productive, is that a virtue? Why? You have to answer the why questions by saying it's a virtue because it leads to a value. It, it is what you need in order to acquire the value. So you go, gotta go back to something more fundamental. So the problem with these other views, these somewhat related eudaimonistic views, is that they're, um, they're on the right track, but they're not essential. They're not thinking in essentialist terms. They're not getting to the essence. Um, once you get to the essence and you see how happiness and character relate to your life, then, uh, you're, then you have a, a package that, that works. And that's what the objectivist ethics does. OK, so <clears throat> let me come to the last topic or the last section on the outline. Uh, we're going to return to this issue of egoism and altruism. Notice that in talking about value and life and reason and production, I didn't use the word self very much, and I didn't use the word selfishness once. Why? Because I was talking about actions, goals, but there is, there is a point, and we're at it, where we can come back to the issue of who's the beneficiary. By the very nature, though, there are two things I really want you to, to get and just nail down in your heads. By the very nature of the, the substantive theory of value that I presented, you have to be the ultimate benef intended beneficiary of your actions. Why? If life is a fundama fundamental value because it's conditional, well, your life is really the only one that depends essentially, necessarily, on you. That's the only fundamental alternative uh, that you face. It's your life, not my life, not your neighbor's life, not even your kids or your um, dearly beloved spouse. Um, so in that sense, you have to be the you have to be the ultimate intended beneficiary of your actions. The way I sometimes put it uh, is that you, you've got one life to live, and it's going to take all your time. <laughs> I, actually, I think I got that from Ayn Rand or maybe Leonard Peikoff, but it's a great way of, of putting it. It's going to take all your time. Your time is your life. Um, and there's a lot to do. 
because uh, our, our principles govern um, are, should, are, are or should be always in play. Uh, for example, I'll advert to uh, one of the questions that came up last time. If um, it was a question about whenever we use the word should, are, are we talking about ethics? Um, well, I, take a case like um, I've got, I got to buy a car. Um, I'm looking at this Hyundai. Yeah, safe, a little boring. I'm looking at this Mazda. Mm. Um, but, you know, all things considered, I've got kids I have to put in the back seat and everything. I should buy the Hyundai. Okay. Now, it's not a moral rule that everyone should buy Hyundais or that every, even everyone with kids should buy Hyundais. But um, on the other hand, this is not something outside the realm of ethics because um, I'm making a decision using my mind. I should be rational. I should take account of the facts. Um, I've got a family, so um, I have responsibilities, and I should exercise responsibility. So these are moral principles. So the rules apply. Uh, even though in application, many other factors can come up um, that are not in themselves uh, broad enough to be moral issues, but um, they're part of it. So that's the sense in which, you know, when we get down to the level of um, uh, buying a Hyundai, <clears throat> you, you can see w what's meant by saying it, your life is going to take all your time. <laughs> so. Okay, so that's the first point. The, the idea, the a fundamental idea of egoism is a versus altruism. The correct philosophical way to put it is who should be the ultimate beneficiary of your action? And the answer <clears throat> comes straight out of the conception of value that I've been laying out. <clears throat> so that's the first broad point. The second point um, I want to stress, the second point to nail down, is that when we talk about self-interest in objectivism, we are not talking about some narrow focus on more money or more power or more whatever the concrete goods are that people um, think of when they think it's selfish. No, we're talking about your self-interest is defined ultimately by your own life and by all the values that make it a successful, happy, virtuous life. That's yourself. You are all of that. That's, that's yourself, and your interest is in maintaining that self, not just your monetary self, not just your sexual self um, for a night or two, but your self for the whole of your life. And because that involves character building and acting in accordance with principles, it is not anything like this, the co normal conception of selfishness. To again um, invoke a, an example from Ayn Rand's fiction, uh, Howard Rourke turns down an uh, architectural commission for a bank building at a time when he desperately needs the work, he needs the commission. Um, but they've, they've taken his design but added some things to make it look a little more conventional. Uh, and um, he, he can't live with that. So he turns down the commission. And someone says, how can you be so completely selfless? And Rourke turns around and says, that was the most selfish thing you, ever see, you have ever seen a man do. Because his self wasn't just the money he'd get from the commission or the fame he'd get from uh, being the architect of this prominent commercial building. Uh, his self was everything that made it possible for him to design the building in the first place, including his love of architecture, his architectural standards, and getting money for now <clears throat> at the cost of those much more important values was, would have been selfless. <clears throat> now, I, I, one thing I haven't um, stressed a good deal, um, because we're going to get to it later, is that to an extent, as I said at the beginning, 
the issue of egoism versus altruism is founded on a sense of conflict um, between the interests of the self and the interests of others. And one aspect of the objectivist ethics, the, the substance of it, which this is our first um, uh, session on the su substantive ethics of objectivism. One part of that is that there, the common sense that there are these deep conflicts of interest among people um, is wrong. It, is, it comes from too narrow um, a conception of what interests are. And that people who are uh, acting rationally and have a sense of, of justice and what they've earned and what they haven't earned, among such people um, who are operating by those standards, there aren't conflicts. The basic human relationship, basic pattern of human relationships should be win-win trading, value for value. We'll get to that much later, but that is, um, I mention it now because it is, it is an important part of um, <clears throat> um, what, one of the important assumptions behind the conventional view of egoism and the conventional defense of altruism as an ethic. But remember this, when we formulate the issue properly, the issue of egoism or altruism, there really is an A versus non-A distinction. Who is, it's an issue of who will be the ultimate beneficiary of your actions. It ha is it yourself? Is it not yourself? A versus not A. It's one or the other. There's no middle ground here in the way many people have sought. Um, you can include, and we all do, we all include many other people um, in our lives on all different levels, from commercial to um, uh, working together on a job, to being friends, to being drinking buddies, bowling buddies, to being part of a family, whatever. And those relationships can be intensely close and intensely important as part of your life. Just in the way you're, you know, playing chess might be a part of your life that doesn't, well, you need a partner, but I mean, it's not a, uh, it's not a really huge social, uh, <laughs> playing solitaire, let me use that example. Um, our relationships with other people can be hugely important, and because they're important, there are virtues associated with achieving and, and keeping those values, and we'll be talking about those um, a little later today. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, when I ask, if I keep asking you, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? Who are you doing it for? At some point, if you say, I'm doing this for my wife, um, I say, okay, why do you want to do that for your wife? Well, because I love her. Why do you love her? Eventually, it's going to back to, this is someone in my life, that, I, that uh, and, and I'm doing something now for that value of value to me. So the, the only alternative is liter, of literal altruism and it ha, would be you should act making others the ultimate beneficiary. Yeah, you can act for yourself because you have to maintain yourself as an instrument if you're going to help others. It's like in the airlines, you get on a plane and they, you know, they demonstrate the oxygen mask. They say, Put your, own, put your own on before you put on your child's so you can keep helping the child. Um, I, that's not, I'm not arguing against the rationality or eth ethical, <laughs> standard, ethical uh, propriety of that particular rule. But you know, this is, uh, altruism will allow you to act for yourself as long as it's not your ultimate intended beneficiary. Um, and there are, so theories like Marxism, like fascism, like Peter Singer, like many religious views are, um, take that line and remove from people, make, make every individual not his or her own ultimate value. But you got to go one way or the other. This is a fork in the road, a logical fork. <clears throat> 
And uh, <clears throat> I've, I've never seen a good reason for going, taking the other road. All right, with that, let me um, stop for questions for, I think we have about 15. Great, okay. I'm loaded with questions today. <laughs> so whenever I was approached before when I would have this discussion or a debate about selfishness, I used to be able to say, well, how is it defined in the dictionary? And it used to be defined as one's own interest. But mm -hmm. now it's changed and it's saying to the exclusion of others. And the connotation of selfishness being negative has now invaded the dictionary, at least the mm -hmm. online versions of it. And how do we counteract that? when we're just having a conversation and we're starting to broach the conversation of objectivism, how do we address or what kind of tools can you give us to overcome that definition now that it's been bastardized? Okay, great question. Um, <clears throat> I, I've come to feel, that, come to think, that um, it's not worth going to the mats over the word selfishness. Yes, uh, Ayn Rand's, the title of her book, The Virtue of Selfishness, was well chosen in the sense it really got your attention. <laughs> but um, the rescue of uh, the concept of selfishness, uh, it's been, what, over 50 years now. <clears throat> and Heather, as you pointed out, it, it doesn't seem to be changing. In fact, if anything, it's, it's descending into um, a more loaded, more bigger package deal of it's bad and uh, because it includes the idea of to the exclusion or at the expense of others. I, uh, I've noticed that too. So, but what I would do in that case is, um, and you know, it, we, we have um, a few 10-foot poles we can use philosophically to um, not to get uh, uh, you know, swamped by that. And one of them is rational self-interest, uh, which we actually use more often, I think, in, in writing about ethics um, philosophically. But in, in everyday life, when people ask that question, I, I would say, your first, I, your, the first question should be the one you said. What do you mean, what do you mean by selfishness? Um, and but then you, your goal in such a conversation should be to move it off the semantic issue and get to the real issues. Um, and there are lots of ways of doing that. Um, like, we, you're, doing, you're doing work. Do you want to get paid for it? Yeah, why? Well, I need the money. Is that the only reason? Don't you think maybe it's partly an issue of pride? You're, you're providing value and you should be getting value back. You shouldn't be disvalued. I mean, that, there was a time when um, <clears throat> it was less common for, for women to be working in corporate situations than it is now. It's certainly at you know, um, higher levels than secretaries and so forth. And they, they did a ton of volunteer work. But one of the things, uh, one of the, I think, really great things about the, the women's movement, the, the, I hesitate the word feminism, but you know, in this context it's appropriate, is to say, no, we deserve better and our work should be valued. Um, you can ask, the people will ask you about selfishness in regard to your kids. I, I, I do all kinds of things, not for myself, but for my kids. And, at some point, I was hearing this often, I just said, from somebody, I just said, all right, it sounds like your kids are kind of a burden. I said, I'll take your kids. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. <laughs> no <laughs> effing way. Um, so, I, you know, that's, you get people to think about, you know, just keep pushing them a little deeper, um, trying to get to the source. There's no magic, it's very contextual. Yes. Um, mine is a bridging the gap between empirical and rationalistic. Um, you mentioned before, I just want to get your clarification on the, um, the verification of, and the validation for your pursuit of life being you know, the content of your life and being your experiential enjoyment of it 
um, versus the deontological, um, your teleology is to live and this like that. So um, you talked against a little bit deontological Kantian ethics applying to everyone and you apply the conditional that Rand uses for if you want to live, then you mm -hmm. must produce, then you must think. Um, so one was just going back to the point of is the validation for why we pursue our own interests hedonistic, is that okay in the empirical sense that we enjoy living so we continue to pursue life in order to keep enjoying it? And two is the mm -hmm. rescue of deont deontological ethics where as a human being you must um, rationalistically, yeah. um, based on your nature, it is required of you logically that you do this. So bridging the gap of those two. So what is the point, what is the validation for your pursuit of life? And um, is there a defense of deontological ethics founded upon the rationalistic foundation of the logical structure of subjectivism? Okay, uh, the, let, me, let me make sure I understand the question. The question is, um, if life is this fundamental choice, um, is, is uh, and the, in that sense, the, the, the foundation for embracing an ethical code, um, is, is there a rationale for doing that that lies in our experience of life? Um, or, and if so, then does that provide a, uh, you use the word deontological, that's a Kantian style duty, categorical imperative um, principle. That, did I get it? Yes. Okay. Um, they're really, they're, in a way, I, I think there are two questions here. One is uh, about the role of experience in, in choosing life. I wrote an essay called Cho Choosing Life. <laughs> and uh, uh, because I, I got interested in the whole issue, you know, in not too many, for most of us, luckily, fortunately, um, the, the, the issue of actually deciding whether to commit suicide or not is, is not, it's not you know, an everyday thing. Um, for many people, it's never a thing. <laughs> but so what does the choice to live mean then? It's not that you chose to be born and then having chosen that, well, you just you know, live with the consequences. Um, and, and it's not that at a moment you choose, well, I'm going to continue. OK, so back to business. Uh, I was asking myself, in what way is it one of these constitutive values, a sense of I'm ch my life is chosen all the time? And in that sense, the hypothetical conditional is the way I look at everything. Do I have to do this? It feels like it, yeah. <laughs> I got to go to this meeting. I got to give this talk. Um, I want to, by the way. But uh, <laughs> uh, I have to do all kinds of things. Well, do I really have to? No, I choose. I could, go, I could go back on my relationship with the Atlas Society and not, not show up here. <laughs> I could lie up to you about the correct answer. I could, it would be easier to say, OK, yeah, Kant was right. Um, <clears throat> but no. Uh, my, the, the point is our experience let me put it this way, life is about achieving values. But the point of achieving them has to be appreciated, experienced. So exp I, I, in, in one way of looking at these issues is achievement and in enjoyment are the two poles of pursuing values. You can't enjoy them unless you achieve them, unless you, you, you're faking something to yourself, that you think you have something you don't. or but if you achieve them without enjoying them, God, that's, that's too type A. Um, I mean, and there are people <laughs> who don't give enough attention to uh, enjoyment. So in that sense, and, and that enjoyment gives us ongoing affirmation uh, that our lives are good, that our lives are good for us, and cements and builds a, to the, you know, the, 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 the choosing life part. Uh, but to turn to your second question, I don't think that that provides any grounds for a Kantian approach. Okay. Um, and I mean, seriously, if someone is in the sad condition of, you know, wanting to call it quits, um, Kant actually uses as an example, he's weary of, uh, someone is weary of living, but out of um, the categorical or categorical imperative against suicide. He goes on living out of duty. That's a good person. Um, he's living from duty, not from desire. 
But realistically, um, I mean, any psychologist will tell, I, I, I assume any psychologist will tell you, um, that's not how you re work with someone who's, you know, so depressed. Yeah. You just try to reconnect them somehow with some values in their lives that they can start rebuilding the motivation. Um, and it's much more a psychological process. It's not, it's not that someone in that condition is, has failed to understand something. Although his thinking is, his thinking is bent um, in terms of the, the significance he attributes to the negative things. But um, it's usually a matter he, he can't connect emotionally with what his mind says. I, yeah, I, I see, the, I see the why that's good. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's a case for Kantian there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good question. It was a hard question, too. <laughs> yes. In Anthem chapter 11, I believe, the hero is saying something to the effect of, I know what happiness is possible to me. I need no further justification for it. And then I heard in Opar, I think you believe that there's a justification for happiness. It seems like a contradiction between what Rand was implying in Anthem mm -hmm. and some of the, like, we need, to, once you understand what real happiness is, the choice to be happy, it seems to me, does not need any moral justification, mm -hmm. but morality is justified as a means to achieving happiness. So that's my view. I think it's expressed in Anthem, and I'm wondering if you comment on yeah, that. Yeah, actually, it, um, thanks for that, for that reference. And um, at one point, um, as I was you know, analyzing and writing about Atlas Shrugged, I went through and um, took every passage, or I can't swear it's every single one, but but there were 10 or 12 distinct passages where Rand has one of the characters speaking about what is ultimately important, what the ultimate is. And it's a very interesting list. I, I included it in a paper I wrote um, recently uh, on, on exactly this issue. <clears throat> um, because Rand will, will talk about achievement as the purpose of man's life, um, uh, uh, life, existence, uh, happiness, joy, all of these things are come up in one place or another. And so where I, what I finally, the conclusion I finally came to um, is that life, happiness, character achievement are so tightly related as part of a good life that you can't peel one off from the other very well. I mean, what is your life? If you, if we say your life is your ultimate value and then uh, virtue is only a means to it, or your life is your ultimate value and that's what makes happiness a value. Um, okay, so let's take what is life then, if, if we abstract it from happiness, from character, from rational action? Well, it's simply, you know, the biological ticking over of your um, internal organs. But that's not, that's not the value that we're talking about. We, we mean, that, I mean, Ayn Rand was clear about this. The survive, it's the survival of you as a rational being over the course of a lifetime. And that means all of you, all your faculties, all your traits, and the experiential capacity, you have to feel happiness. And I mean, look, I, happiness is a great motivator. <laughs> uh, presumably, that's a big part of why um, we have emotions and a pleasure pain mechanism, you know, thanks to evolution. Uh, and um, so when you say that my happiness is its own justification, yeah, that doesn't bother me at all in terms of what I was saying. Because I, in speaking as a philosopher, um, 
even though I, I see these different things, these different aspects or attributes of happiness and character and achievement, uh, joy, as integral parts of the value of life, constitutive parts of the value of life. Still, as a philosopher, we have to go back to, okay, what is the, of, in that package, in that nested set of values that we've conceptualized, which one is the fundamental one? What is it that really, that actually gives rise to the concept of value? And I think Rand's argument about um, tracing it back to the uh, conditional nature of life is, is the reason for saying life is the ultimate value, philosophically. But psychologically, yeah, go, go for happiness. <laughs> uh, go for character. Uh, go for eudaimonia. Eudaimon I don't know why I keep stumbling over that. Anyway, uh, we're done. Thanks so much. <laughs>